Hi, I'm Lisa K. Donner, along with Andrew Moran, Sarah Calgill, Graham Noble, and Joe Schaefer. And this is the Conservative Five, Liberty Nation's online TV news program. On today's episode, What in the World? All Eyes on Ukraine will discuss the ever-changing landscape of war in Europe. In Liberty Nation, so too, our panel will give you the real State of the Union without the spin. In Trump's to-do list, we get down to the nitty gritty of how he can reclaim the White House, the do's and don'ts. For our member zone segment, we examine the worldwide reaction to the bully on the Eastern Bloc, that's Putin versus the world. And finally, we let off a bit of steam in our just for fun segment. This is one you won't wanna miss folks. All this and more coming up in this edition of the Conservative Five. Well, as most of our viewers know, Russia invaded Ukraine a little more than a week ago, and the world snapped to attention. Social media exploded with images of soldiers, battle sites, and unlikely heroes. Messages both inspiring and heartbreaking have dominated every media outlet. The invasion that Russia started is unrelenting and exhausting. Let's face it, the act of war in our time is a danger to the entire world. Liberty Nation has followed every angle and story of the Russian attack. Graham, let's kick things off with you. You've seen war up close and personal. You know, what's your take on what we see going on in Ukraine? Uh, Well, Lisa, let me start by just giving uh, everybody a kind of uh, an update on on where we are at the moment. Um, The Russians have effectively... I wouldn't use the word captured so much as at least kind of cut off and they control uh, ingress and egress into three Ukrainian cities in the east of the country. Um, There's Kherson, which is now in the news today. The Russians basically are saying they've captured Kherson, although the mayor is saying that's not true. Um, Kherson is a a port city just to the north of the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, The Russians have also captured uh, Mariupol, And uh, they've captured another city called Melitopol. And both of those are in the eastern part of the country. Um, And then, of course, they're still obviously uh, laying siege to the capital. Uh, In terms of casualties, the UN is saying um, that there are hundreds of civilian casualties. um, But we don't know for sure the exact number. Unfortunately, that's, that's a number that we may not know for some time in reality. Uh, Troop casualties... The Russians say as of yesterday that they've lost 498 soldiers and the Ukrainians say that they've killed 3,500 Russian soldiers. <laughs> so obviously the, uh, you know, the truth, uh, the real number is obviously somewhere in between that. Um, and Ukrainian mi- military casualties are not clear. Um, but in terms of how this war is going, I, I think really, you know, th- it appears that there doesn't seem to have been a Russian strategy other than let's pour, you know, troops into this country and fight until the Ukrainians give up. And obviously, they did not count on the resistance they would encounter. Um, but actually, there is a strategy going on behind the scenes because the Russians are targeting, okay, they are hitting civilian areas, they are causing civilian casualties, we shouldn't downplay that. But they are actually going after Russian, after Ukrainian military installations. And they've hit, you know, prob- I believe more than 100 of them so far. Um, well, and, prob- and probably destro- destroyed quite a few. But, you know, the, the worst thing about this, for, from Putin's point of view, uh, unless he's completely de- delusional, which at this point he may be, is the fact that he's kind of shown his hand militarily. The Russian armed forces have not done a good job here at all. And I think he's kind of revealed to both NATO and to the Chinese because the Chinese and the Russians, everyone thinks they're buddy-buddy, but they don't trust each other. China is a potential future adversary for the Russians. And Putin has now shown that his armed forces don't measure up. I mean, in a conventional war against NATO, they're going to get decimated, I, I honestly believe. Um, so yeah. he's m- made a grave error in that respect. And, and just to wrap up, I would say that he's only got two choices left. Really, he cannot afford to lose this war at all. So he can either carry on pouring troops in, lose thousands of Russian soldiers and eventually win by attrition. Or he's got to at some point accept some kind of negotiated peace and then say, 
well, you know, I forced the Ukrainians to submit to my will, and that's really all I was trying to do all along. Well, Graham really makes quite a good point, Sarah, and this was supposed to be a slam dunk. And we've got some emerging heroes, not the least of which the one that begins with a Z. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, who would have thought that their president of a country would take up arms and go out on the front lines and defend his country? Um, there is a beauty queen that was Miss Ukraine in, in the world, whatever beauty contest that is. She's armed and out there. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on social media. And it's 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 a beautiful way to show that um, patriotism is really um kind of the great equalizer, you know, a lot, a lot of great things have been accomplished with undermanned, under um, armed armies, obviously 1776 in that neck of the woods. Um, You know, they, when there's, where there's a will, there's a way. And I'm impressed with these guys. I, I didn't ever expect that to happen. I just figured that Ukraine would go in there or uh, Russia would go in and just roll over them. And they're just not going to let that happen. Right. And Joe, there have been a lot of surprises. I mean, nobody expected Ukraine to be hanging on this long and Kiev to, you know, still be in the hands of the Ukrainians. And, you know, meanwhile, Zelensky's going on social media or his iPhone or whatever, rallying the troops, inspiring the world. Well, what's disturbing to me, if I can just pour kind of some cold water over all this is, I don't, we don't know what to believe what's going on. The disinformation is out of this world. Uh, the American media, the Western media is fomenting so much of it. We have these fictitious stories of comic book character Ukrainian soldiers just wiping out like entire Russian divisions by themselves, it seems like. So, you know, you, you have to put that into perspective. From my point of view, from the America First point of view, which is why I try to come from, is that I'm worried about American casualties. Our own president, yes, uh, the day after the State of the Union went to Wisconsin and declared that the January 6th protesters, the Trump supporters at the U.S. Capitol, basically emboldened Putin to invade Ukraine. Uh, That is an attack on the American people by our president using this war, this very serious war where people are dying and it's a tragedy to just take a shot at the American people here. That's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the framing that the ruling establishment is choosing this war. They're imposing their rules-based international order ideas on the Ukrainian people. Now, the Ukrainian people are not fighting for homosexual rights in Denver, Colorado. You know, so, (laughs) you know, that's, it's how Biden, how the Western ruling establishment is framing this is what disturbs me the most. You know, Andrew, uh, Joe brings up an interesting point about a lot of fake news, but it's really hard to fake the economic news, isn't it? And it's pretty bad for uh, Russia right now. Yeah, I have a source in the Kremlin, and he was telling me that uh, Vladimir Putin, that he, he's thinking of retreating because he heard that there's a French uh, diner that they're changed the name of their poutine uh, meals to just French fries with gravy and cheese because of how it shares with Putin. So I think that so that I've heard that that's happening. But yeah, the economics of it all. I mean, I look at this whole thing from an economics point of view, and you can see that the person who's going to benefit the most from if this war ever ends, is Zelensky. You know, he's going to get his wish of Ukraine joining the European Union. He submitted his application. He's most likely going to get approved. He's going to, Ukraine's going to join NATO, although there are some technicalities, but it's most likely going to happen. When this war is over, if it's ever over, Ukraine's going to get all these billions of dollars in, in loans and grants and money and aid. He's going to get all this humanitarian aid, military aid, financial aid. Just, it's not going to stop. All this capital is going to flow into Ukraine, and he's going to make that country prosperous, you know, whether or not joining European Union is, is a wise move in this environment. But overall, Ukraine's, Ukraine went in the aftermath of the war. It's going to be much better off than it was before uh, the war with uh, Putin. Well, Ukraine is clearly outmanned and outgunned, but even David managed to slay Goliath. And at this point, it seems like everyone, save Vladimir Putin, is rooting for Ukraine. Thanks, panel. President Joe Biden delivered his first State of the Union address this week, attempting to assure Americans that the country is strong. Well, that's a bit of a difficult case to make. Inflation, the pandemic, massive illegal immigration, 
Woo, none of these issues lends itself to a strong union. And Americans are now asking, where the heck has Joe Biden been these past 14 months? Good question. It was an interesting tale Biden tried to spin at best, but the conservative five panel is here to give you the authentic state of the union, Liberty Nation style. So how do you see the country uh, just a little more than a year into Joe Biden's presidency? We're going to start with a real Joe Biden fan, Joe Schaefer. <laughs> uh, I, it's pretty much as I expected. This guy got in with no popular acclaim. Uh, the Democrats themselves, the grassroots Democrat voters, had to bite the bullet to support this guy. And here we are. He uh, he's finally gives his first State of the Union address. Skip the, skip the other one. And uh, he had two Democrats giving rebuttals. A uh, Congressional Black Caucus representative and Rashida Tlaib giving a progressive rebuttal. So he can't even unite his own party, much less the American people. He's always talking about how divided we are, and he continues to divide us. The, the divisive rhetoric coming out of the White House is seemingly never ending. It's interesting to be politically. What kind of clout does this guy have? He is in the White House. He is in the most powerful seat in the world. And can he really drive an agenda? His own party obviously doesn't think so. You have these Democrats, they're basically sitting in the back seat with a car whining. You know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Because he was supposed to be the vehicle to fulfill all those wild hopes they had in that crazy 2020 Democratic presidential primary season. And he has not been an effective vehicle really for them at all, if anything, a liability. He's going to be an anchor around their necks at the midterm elections. The State of the Union for the Democratic Party with Joe Biden as its titular head, and he is not their head in any way, but he is in that role. The State of the Union for Democrats is looking pretty disastrous right now. Well, speaking of Joe's popularity, we got to move over to Sarah here, our uh, very political uh, gal. Sarah, Joe is in the toilet. He's uh, and the water is swirling, so I, I don't I don't see him coming around anytime soon to to save himself. Um, you know, there's too many problems. He glossed over in the State of the Union, he glossed over the main problems by like dismissing them as, uh, oh, it's just a pesky little thing here and there and we don't need to worry about it. Well, you know, if you talk to the people in Arizona or New Mexico or Texas that live on the border in and around that border, they're expecting 2 million illegal immigrants to flood across that border. And that's just the people they catch, not the people they don't catch. Well, and, but what, and, wait a minute. What did he say in the, his, the state of the union? He, he, you know, he's let so many people in and what did he say? We have to, we have to protect and, and manage immigration. That's not what he's doing. I know. Um, and the other thing that he just sort of, you know, it's just like, well, let's give everybody citizenship and then they're not illegal anymore. And, it, you know, that's he's he's more frustrating to listen to from a speechwriter point of view than Donald Trump at any given moment. It's just like, oh, my gosh, you know, are you are you seriously saying this out loud when everybody knows better and, and everybody knows he's just opening the doors? He's got to He's pleasing the progressives and the open borders people. And then he's trying to still stay on the fence. And that man's got some splinters in his rear end at this point because, you know, he's straddling that fence and it's not working out for him. He's just scooting along and it is not going to work out. I mean, everybody is pissed at him. Sorry. Everybody is angry at him. Um, you know, when your own party has two rebuttals, you know, where's the voice of reason? Well, you but Sarah, there, there is no wall. There's no wall high enough to keep out a vaccine. Remember that. Uh, right. That's wisdom from Joe Biden. But, but Andrew, you can't go too far on the State of the Union without saying it's the economy, stupid. Oh, I, I was messaging Sarah throughout the uh, the State of the Union address, <laughs> and she she knows what I was talking about. Oh my God, it was just so frustrating to watch from the economic point of view. You know, all the things he's talking about it just it makes your head spin. You know, one of his th first things he he announced during the economic part of his speech, he was saying he was going to release thirty million barrels from the Strategic Reserve. That's somehow going to curb oil prices. 
The U.S. consumes at least 17 million barrels a day. That's good enough for maybe three days worth of energy. The second is that he was so proud that he slashed the deficit in half. Of course, that's going to happen when you reopen the country and people are working and are spending. Of course, that's going to lead to tax. Re- that's going to lead to tax revenue. Uh, the thing that bothered me a lot too was when you're talking about pharmaceuticals and insulin. And he wasn't wrong about the price of insulin. What he was wrong about is the, ca- the cause of it. He's, he's talking about greed. He doesn't talk about how it's because of the FDA. He doesn't talk about how the FDA grants uh, monopoly privileges. He doesn't talk about bats patent abuse. He doesn't talk about restrict- uh, restri- uh, restricting uh, general insulin and the overall cost of that. And then the other thing, too, that really bothers me, he thinks that price controls are somehow going to be the panacea to higher pharmaceuticals. And then he also repeated the same fallacy that, oh, it's because of big meat that uh, – food prices are so high and how it was only four co- companies control most of the market. That's such nonsense because if that were the case, look at it this way. If, if these meat companies could control the price, they would have either dramatically raised the price before the pandemic, you know, making all this money, or they could have undercut their competitors and get even greater market share of the, of the, of the uh, food market. So everything he said, I mean, you could do a whole C5 show about it. You can do a radio segment, podcast, everything. Everything except the economy was just mostly dead wrong. This year. I was just kind of excited that you said big meat. That's the funniest dang thing. And I, I might just be a little immature, but that cracks me up <laughs> when there's actual big meat, like big pharma, big meat. Holy I got moly. some big vegan meat, Sarah. I got some <laughs> big vegan sausages. Graham, <laughs> hit us with what you, what you think the state of the union it really is at this point. Well, I, I think it's... Uh, I think it is, as um, I believe it was Gerald Ford once said, the State of the Union is not good. Um, And I think that is an understatement right now. Um, It's shocking. Uh, I'd like to say on that, on the on the economic front real quick. Yeah, I find it funny the way that uh, the uh, the left wing media and the Democrats are, are putting out this narrative that that all of these rising prices right now, uh, are about that all of these greedy corporations have suddenly decided to jack up their prices to make this huge amount of extra profits. Well, you know, I think we all know, I think whether you're a conservative or a, or a progressive or a liberal, whatever you want to call yourself, I think everyone accepts the fact that, that corporations are motivated, you know, by a certain amount of greed for profits. And if it was, just, you know, why is it all of a sudden that they've all now Just when Joe Biden got into office, they all decided, they all got together and said, let's all jack up our prices and make a bunch of extra money. Why didn't they do that five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? So that's nonsense. But I would come back again to the Ukraine part of his speech. Um, First of all, you've got to give Biden credit where it's due. The fact that we we are supporting the struggle of the Iranian people is a good thing. Um, But other than that, this is nonsense. You know, his his remarks on Ukraine in the speech were were particularly egregious because we're not really doing anything to deter Russia at all, to be honest. I mean, they talk about these crushing um, economic sanctions against Russia. I mean, some of them are effective, but, you know, we're still buying Russian oil. We're, we're, it's almost as if we're, we're actually um, financing Putin's war. So, you know, I thought anything he said about standing against Russia was, quite frankly, as nonsense. You know, it was obvious that Biden was trying to change directions. And and personally, if I hear the word unity one more time, I'm going to take hostages. But, you know, he was trying to pivot from that long, dark winter to come on, man, it's all good. But, you know, I'm not sure that really resonated with the American public, which is paying more for gas, more for meat, more for bacon. That's still another meat. But you know what I mean? Paying uh, about 10% inflation, apparently, according to Stuart Varney, starting uh, next week. It's, it's a bad situation, and, and I, I don't think you can make a silks purse into a sow's ear. I thought it was particularly cringeworthy when he said, we're going to be okay. And I'm not going to pretend to, I'm not going to try to impersonate uh, uh, Biden. I'll leave, sure that, to, uh, on, I'll leave that to Andrew. But I almost felt like he was going to whisper that in that creepy way he does, you know, we're going to be okay. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Seriously now. But seriously, thanks, panel. Donald Trump delivered a blistering keynote address at the Conservative Political Action Conference, known as CPAC. And now folks seem certain he'll be on the 2024 ballot. But will he? The straw poll taken at the event gave him the edge, 59%, with 
with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis a distant second at 28%. Is that enough for Trump to run? If the 45th president does throw his red MAGA hat into the ring, what does he need to win at this time? And what does he need to do at this time? Maybe more importantly, what should he not do? Sarah, what's on your to-do list for Mr. Trump? Oh, dial it back. Hey, you know, he's got to, he's, he's, he's really got to come across as I've learned my lessons. Uh, and that lesson is drop the whole 2020, oh, the election was rigged and they stole it. And just drop that. You've got to drop that. You've got to move forward. You got to move on. I mean, the Democrats do the same thing. They just grasp onto something, but that's you not going to get him. I just want to break in and completely agree with you. He's got to let the election go because I, I, I just think we, we've got to move forward. People are sick of it. Everybody's tired of it. We just, we just want to, you know, turn the ship back around. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know how that's going to happen. And I don't know whoever wins in 2024. I don't know how that's going to happen. I, I don't know how they're going to do it. I mean, it can't, it's not going to happen overnight, even though it seems like the destruction of this country happened in eight, nine months. Um, but he has got to focus on, you know, just stop being the bully. I told you so in the room and say, you know, let's get back on track. Come on, let's do this together. He's got to stop saying, I, 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 and America, 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 we, we, we. That's that's my take on it. You know, Joe, you're you're a self-identified America first or where where do you stand on this? Well, I would stand with completely disagreeing with both of you for the first part. Uh, the vast wait, 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 majority, the be, vast he, majority, the vast to, majority. Wait a minute. He needs to beat the election into the ground coming up in 2024. The vast majority of Republican grassroots voters, not my opinion, not your opinion, not Sarah's opinion. The vast majority of Republican grassroots voters do not buy the narrative of the 2020 election. They believe there was serious issues that could really could result in 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 true electoral fraud, and they do not want to let it go. And and Trump realizes this. He realizes that this is an issue that that resonates with the Republican voting base. He's not just bringing up as some kind of pout on his part. This rings true with Republican voters. Yes, so Joe, him, it doesn't ring true with independents. Excuse me? It doesn't ring true with independents, and it sure as hell doesn't ring true with the Republicans that couldn't stand what he was doing and voted for this guy yeah, we got now. Yeah, yeah. Adam Timsinger doesn't like it. We all know that. Okay, already, okay? Some of them the Republican must have had voting base wa- wants to confront this issue. They do not want to sweep it under the rug. You're seeing this in states right now, in Arizona, in Wisconsin, they're not letting it go. They shouldn't let it go. And I think it's going to energize Republican voters. They're already so motivated to, to, to give the Joe Biden a, re, a rebuke. And I don't see how Trump mentioning what happened in 2020 hurts him at all. In fact, it helps him. But you're right. He does need to do other things. And I agree. The big thing he needs to do is to, first of all, stop endorsing and supporting people who are opposed to him. That's the number one thing I wish he would stop doing. He loves he loves endorsing people. I understand that. But he needs to get allies. He needs to get um, America first Trump people elected to the House and the Senate and governorships. And he needs to focus. He, he talks a good game about no more rhinos, no more doing this. And then he turns around and he endorses these people. So he needs to build a movement is what I'm worried about. I'm very worried about that. It's just about Trump. And then when he does eventually, you know, go away, it, it, it all melts away with him. We, uh, the America first, the populist nationalist reaction that happened in 2016 is not going to go away. But Trump as the prime mover of that, he's so valuable. He is still so valuable. He proved that CPAC again. He is the unifying force behind it at the moment. He is not going to be affected unless he builds something with that that will last after him. And that, that is what he really needs to do. And he needs to do it going towards 2024. Graham. Well, uh, of course, the whole 2020 election question is interesting. And I, I, I tend to be more um, in line with Joe's thinking on that, although I do understand that we don't. I think what gets people more than anything else when Trump starts talking about the 2020 election is is the fact that when he he holds these rallies, he will 
he will just like in minute detail, he will, we will, he will recount the events or the perceived events of that election night. And he'll just go through the whole thing. And I think that's what really gets people tired. It's like they don't want another blow by blow recounting of that particular night. But I don't think, uh, I agree with Joe that most, uh, I believe that most Republicans and certainly, um, obviously, all of Trump's supporters, uh, I, and I believe actually probably more independents than we know, uh, do not actually believe that the 2020 election result was legitimate. And I don't think anybody should forget about it. But yes, I do understand. We can't just go on and on and on about it like a broken record. Uh, one thing Trump's going to have to do, and he can... Uh, and he can use the situation in Ukraine as a, as a great example of this, is one thing he's got to promise is a return, uh, full speed, a return to energy independence, real energy independence, the energy we're using now, not some magical, you know, fairy dust. And, 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 and uh, I was almost going to say a bad word there, but I won't. Um, but, um, you know, the rene let's just say renewables. That's a bad enough word. You know, this fantasy that we're all going to be running on wind power, you know, 10 years from now, not going to happen. So I think energy independence uh, Ukraine has shown that energy independence is vitally important for this country. And so, yes, uh, Trump does need to talk about that, obviously. And he needs to talk about, unfortunately, just, you know, we like presidents to look forward rather than look back. But in this case, I think Trump is going to have uh, to say to people, look, look what position we were in, in, uh, you know, before the pandemic. Um, right. And that's what we need to get back to. We need to secure the border, rebuild the military. We need energy independence. So I think if he if he actually does run again, he's going to have to be kind of retro. He's going to have to go back to those to those good old days before the pandemic and say, look, we can get all that back. We can do it. Andrew, don't you think he should, you know, just it could be just as simple as beat the drum about the economy. I mean, you know, the, the COVID definitely had an impact on the Trump economy. But, you know, we were energy independent and now we're, you know, begging for oil from Russia. If, yeah, you're right. I make, make one point about the whole 2020 election thing. Whether Trump moves on from it or not, the media is not going to move on from it. They're going to ask him, do you think the 2020 election was stolen or not? He's going to say yes. And he's going to whole thing about it. And then they're going to keep asking him, just like if he denounces white supremacy. And then, you know, they keep asking him and then they say, oh, why isn't he denouncing white supremacy? Now about the economy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But I also think that, you know, Lisa, we need to move on from Donald Trump. OK, we need to we need to focus on other America first pro-capitalist, pro-economic growth Republicans, okay? We need to focus on those people, not so much about me. And yeah, energy independent, that's crucial. I mean, Trump can say, hey, when, after 40 years of every president saying, yo, we're going to be energy independent, I achieved it on my watch. But he can't say so much about fiscal conservatism because he ran one of the biggest deficits. He increased national debt. He spent like a drunken sailor. So on that front, he can't really celebrate. But for the most part, he can focus on, as Graham said, energy independence and deterring Russia from uh, in invading Ukraine. I want to say one more thing before you wrap this up. And it's at, 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 it's at Joe and it is at Graham. I live in the heart, heart of the silent majority I know people who were Republican that voted against Donald Trump and they say, well, we didn't think it was going to be this bad. But last night I had a nice long conversation with several of these very conservative people. And they said, if he runs again, I'll do the same thing, no matter who's on the opposite side. They hate him. OK, well, I don't think we're going to solve this today, but thank you. Perhaps the doom and gloom of the president administration will go a long way toward the former president becoming the next president. And let's remember that's only happened once. Or maybe it's just as simple as Donald Trump is not being Joe Biden. Thanks, panel. Well, we're back to share a little lighthearted banter to help shoo away the winter blues and scenes of war. In this episode of Just For Fun, we hearken back to the hard choices and we'll play Would You Rather? Thank you. 
panel, when I call you out, pick a number between one and five. I'll read the question from this mysterious paper and you get to pick the most palatable answer. Liberty Nation gremlins have crafted these scenarios and none of us have been privy to the questions in advance. And I just hit the microphone, but Frank can take that out. Anyway, I haven't even read these. So, Andrew, pick a number and unmute your mic. Three. Three for Andrew. Your job is media consultant. Would you rather take on Donald Trump or Joe Biden and why? Oh, it's so much easier to do a Donald Trump impression. So I definitely have to go with Donald Trump. And it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Although, you know, if you can tell, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not as eloquent when I speak. So perhaps it's also easier to do a Biden impression. So perhaps I can do a, a mixture of the two. I can do uh, no joke, no joke. Okay. I'm serious about that. I'm serious. I'm both, I'm Donald Biden. Okay. I'm Donald Biden. <laughs> You got to add a come on, man. Come on, man. I'm Donald Biden. Okay, <laughs> that's who I am. All righty. Graham, you're up. One, two, four, and five are left. One, please. One. Let me mark that down without hitting the microphone again. If you could, would you rather be on the staff of President Lincoln or the staff of President Teddy Roosevelt? Wow. I know my answer to that. What, what do you say? Good grief. Um, uh, okay, I'll uh, give you time to think. I'll give you time to think and I'll answer your question. Definitely <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt. This was, a, this was a fascinating guy. I think I've read like four of his, his, you know, biographies and, you know, what an interesting human being he was. Yeah, Not he was shot that- at once and he still delivered a speech right after. I know, I know. And he lived this amazing life. He was like he was a scrawny little sickly kid. You know, and he ended up looking like a bull moose, you know, and I'm not. I, I would I, I, definitely take him as well, because, you know, a I'm not really sure I'd like to be around the Civil War era, <laughs> but B, the national park system, all the things that he did, and all of his travels. I, I'd have been on a horse ride along with him. Fascinating. Yeah, I, 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 I think I was having a I, I think I had a pause there for a minute because I was thinking of the the eras involved. I was thinking of the time. And of course, I was thinking of the, the Civil War. And I thought, well, what a you know, OK, in some respects, a very unpleasant time to be around in, in the United States, but also a fascinating time. But then really, yes, I mean, Roosevelt so much more of a colorful, interesting character than Lincoln, quite frankly. So, um, yeah, I'd have to go with I'd have to go with Teddy, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Joe Schaefer, you've got two, four, or five. Let's spin the wheel. What do you say? I'll go Bobby Orr. Give me number four. Bobby Orr, number four, as White House chef. You would, ra- would you, excuse me, would you rather create a state dinner for Putin or Kim Jong un? And what would you serve? Oh my God, this is a great question. <laughs> Uh, Kim Jong-un just weirds me out too much. I wouldn't even want to be in the same room with him. At least Putin, I, it would be fascinating. It would be an interesting conversation. I would be uh, quite sure. Um, yeah, I imagine he would want his steak very rare, very bloody. <laughs> and, Maybe um, laced with hemlock, I'm just, just saying. They're kind of into poison over there, aren't they? I mean, that's well, right. That's the plan right enough. What can I say? I think I think cooking a state dinner for for um, Kim would be much easier because let's face it, you know he's from North Korea. You could you could give him a you could give him a plate of baked beans and he'd think it was great. Oh God, I thought you were going to say a plate of Shih Tzu or something like that. Oh, but... no. all right, just kidding, just kidding. I'm a dog lover. Everybody knows that. But but seriously, wouldn't you pick Kim Jong Un because he looks like he likes to eat? Is he the one every who, chef likes to cook for somebody who likes to eat? Is he the one who eats the Western diet? I, I got lose track of the North Korean dictators. He's the one who he, he eats McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken all the time. Was that was that one of his predecessors? No, I think you're right. I think that is true. That is him, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure they have a table big enough to serve uh, Putin. If anybody's been paying attention, I know he, he's got this yeah, isolationist table. thing. He's like having meetings with his own him. people and they're in the, you know, 20 feet away. He's, so I'm not sure that, that he could. He could that's even social in distance room. in Russia style. Yeah. Yeah. No it's really <laughs> creepy. It's totally creepy. It is okay, a little creepy. So I'm supposed to keep up on this. So four done. 
All right, so two and five are left. So, Sarah? Uh, two. Would you rather tag along with Nancy Pelosi on a shopping trip or go bar hopping with Kamala Harris? Oh, my goodness. I know the answer to this one. The bar hopping. I'd have to be drunk to do either one of those things. So I would uh, definitely go bar hopping and and hopefully she didn't have her secret service detail and there could be a bitch fight in the bathroom. Just a Can, kind of look like she likes to throw back a few. I think she well, I, she, and then she gets up to, to me. Podium. She has been throwing back mic. a few and then going on stage. So, right. Then she goes up to the mic and everybody's like, whoa, she's stoned. I'm like, well, I think she's tipsy. Well, I don't I don't think that is an either or situation at all, because you go bar hopping with uh, with Kamala Harris. You're going to bump into Nancy Pelosi. I mean, she is drunk all the time. <laughs> you know, you're right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, on that shopping trip, she would probably go, let's just swing in here before we go to the fur store. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Or you, you can wear uh, uh, an earplug and get drunk enough and think you're talking to Tulsi Gabbard. That's all sweet. Oh, we need uh... Tulsi to make, make an Okay, here we go. Uh, you know, I always go last. I think next time I'm going to go first. Number five, as chairman of the Republican Party, you get to strongly suggest the next candidate for president. Would you rather run run with Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis? And who do you pick as a running mate? You know, I I, I don't even have to think about this one. I definitely rather run with Trump. I mean, I, I like DeSantis. I'm sitting here in beautiful Florida. I think DeSantis has done a great job. But God, Trump is an interesting guy. I, I mean, he's fascinating. I thought it was interesting to watch him and Pence talk about the yin and the yang. So, you know, for me, definitely, I, I'd like to run with Donald Trump. I think it would be amazing. Yeah, he's a force of nature, whether you like him or not. And Ron DeSantis, I'm in Florida also. Everything he says is great. He's got a good future. He, he certainly could be a 2028 candidate, but he's not the hurricane that Trump is. At least he's not yet. Maybe he's still forming. Donald Trump is a hurricane right now. And, yeah, you know, no. Fun absolutely. to get in that path. I think I agree. Trump would definitely be much more fun to hang out with if you're if you want to go that route, because seriously, very serious toe the line kind of guys are kind of boring, uh, especially as candidates. So as a candidate, that would be kind of fun to run with Trump. Yeah, well, you could always go bar hopping with Kamala and Nancy, then get on the plane and have a Big Mac with Donald. Yeah, yeah there you go. I could eat that. Well, we may have went off the rails a bit, but hopefully you all enjoyed it as much as we did. Thanks, guys. That's it for our Conservative 5 panel today. Check out our other C5 shows and segments on your favorite video platform, YouTube, Vimeo, Rumble, or on the mall. As well, Liberty Nation has its own Roku channel where you can see all of our TV productions. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, surf on over to libertynation.com. Join us for the Member Zone, just $17.76 for the year. Thanks so much to our fantastic editor and post coordinator, Frank Diorio, our executive producer, Sarah Calgill. I'm Lisa K. Donner, Editor-in-Chief. Thanks for joining us today. This has been a production of LibertyNation.com, where truth is making a comeback. <laughs>